So all we did was find cos i using expansion, the Taylor series expansion, simplifies down to that very nicely. And we didn't really sh prove any identities, but we did write them down. So here's the identities we're going to be using soon. Oh, and the last one, the fact that e to any power is never going to be zero. And our next chapter, or section 19, is linear independence of functions. And this is 19a. So if I stopped at the word linear independence, probably most of you who took linear algebra could tell me what linear independence is. You, you would probably be thinking linear independence of variables. And you add up a linear combination, and if, that, if there's a way to make that zero such that not all the coefficients are zero, then it's linearly independent. There's some other equivalent ones you learned, but that's based the definition of linear independence. And we're going to be looking at linear independence of functions. So we need to define what that means. So we'll start out supposing our functions. So our functions we'll call f1, f2, to fn. So there's going to be n functions. Suppose these n functions have a common domain. So when we say common domain, we mean all their domains are the exact same set. So whether it's an open interval, closed interval, union of some open and closed intervals, but all the functions have the same domain. Uh, they're linearly independent If there are constants, so we'll go in linear algebra I used alphas for these alpha one, alpha two, alpha n. I think your textbook uses C's. So my notes have C's written in them. So we'll go with that. Oh, and we're defining linear dependence, not independence. So erase the in off the front of independence. So we're going for linearly dependent. If there exists constants, that not all the C's are zero, and C1, F1, plus C2, F2, plus Cn, Fn is equal to zero. Now, if F1 through Fn were just variables, we, could, we would basically be done here, or, or just vectors, we would be done here. Uh, but <coughs> We have to be a little careful because with functions, they have to add up to zero f for every x in their domain, not just for one or two x values. But this happens, has to happen for every single x in their domain. And remember, all the domains were the same, so I can just say for every x in the domain of the first function. Or maybe it's better to write for all x in the common domain, which will be the domain of every function. So you, I would know what you mean. 
But technically, I didn't call any of these functions just f. Um, so I couldn't, that would be logically incorrect so to just. Have to write where the common domain is the domain. One, one way to do it would be in fk for k equals 1, 2, n. That would be another way to write it. Uh, but technically, none of these functions are called f. So if you, if you just write f, uh, you'll be talking about something that's not, that we didn't define here. All right, so that's what it means to be linearly uh, dependent. And what do you think it means to be linearly independent? Not this. So how do we negate this? How do we write not this? So we have to be very careful. All of the there exists turn into all. Uh, so it has to be for all constants. Let's use our zero. Yeah, but you also have to be careful. It would be for all constants that are not all zero, that that function is not zero for at least one x in the domain. Okay. So all of your for alls change to there exists, and your there exists change to for alls. Anyways, let's not worry too much about that. We'll just say if you're not dependent, then you're independent. So we'll test for dependence, and if we fail the test, then we're independent. How about that? Instead of trying to convert the test to test for independence. So this is better this way because you will see if your function is 0. For example, uh, this if you added up your constants and you got like c1x plus c2, um, this is not going to be equal to 0 for all x's. I mean, unless c1 and c2 are both 0. But if c1 is not 0, well, uh, then c1 is not 0. Any x that's not equal to 0 would most likely work. And if c1 is 0, uh, then any c2 that's not 0 would make this function not 0. All right, so let's get started on some examples. Independent, or I should say dependent or not. My hand's not broken, it's the computer. It's supposed to be an E. I'm going to write the functions just written, um, not f1 equals x, f2 equals x squared. I'm just going to separate the expressions with commas, just like I did up above. We're just listing function 1, comma, function 2, comma, function 3, comma, function 4. All right, independent or not independent? So what we do is we add up, so I need four constants, C1, 2, 3, and 4. And these do need to be real number coefficients. C1x plus C2x squared plus C3x cubed plus C4 2x. The question is, can I very carefully pick four numbers, four c values, that make this zero for all x's? And some of them can be zero as long as not all of them. I can't have, so obviously if I choose all as four is zero, I'll get zero. But that would not be, uh, just going up here, mm -hmm. not all c's can be zero. So a lot of them can be zero, but there needs to be at least one. Chances are they'll usually be two or more that need to not be zero. So what combination, there are infinite correct choices, 
but there's one or two more obvious choices. C1 is uh, 2, C4 is 1, and C2 and C3 is 0. Or negative, sorry. One, two, negative. Yeah. And then you are basically, you do have to choose C2 and C3 to both be zero or else you're not going to be able to get your x squared and your x cubed to cancel out any other way. Mm -hmm. So those have to be, you don't have a choice on two and three. You've got to go with the... Um, if C1 is equal to C3, then C2 is Let me do some algebra, and then and we'll see the relationship um, fall out. So I see that we have x terms. We have two x terms. So we'll uh, combine those together. So we have c1 plus 2c4. Jeez. It's bad. And remember, this is supposed to be zero for not just certain x values, but for all x values in the domain. And we start out polynomials, so our domain is all real numbers. So this needs to work for all x's. So from here, you can see that I need c2 and c3 to be zero. And I also need the first coefficient to be zero. So I need c1 plus 2, c4 to equal zero. And c2 to equal 0, c3 to equal 0. So that means c1 is negative 2, c4. You can pick any number you want for c4, except which value? 0 is not good, because if I pick 0 for c4, I'll get 0 for c1, and I won't be, uh, I'll have all of them as 0. So I can choose anything I want that's not 0 for c4. I think the obvious one to choose is 1. So C1 is 2 times negative 2 times 1, which is negative 2. So that's almost what we got at the beginning uh, when we were guessing. But if we went with negative 1 for C4, we would get exactly what we saw originally right there. Mm -hmm. So they're both completely correct. Does it matter what specific ones you choose as long as they're not all 0? All right, so we found non-zero coefficients that made it zero. So this is linear dependence. We found zero coefficients. made the linear combination equal to 0 for all x in the common domain. So in this case, common domain happened to be negative infinity to infinity. So polynomials get their full domain. If it was rational functions or square roots, so I'd have to be a little more careful. All right, so linear, which I didn't write down, linear dependence. So the first one is dependent. So our second set of functions e to the px and e to the qx, where p is not the same number as q. And Let's look really quickly. What is our common domain of these two functions? Can you raise e to any power? 
Yep, positive powers are what you're thinking, negative powers are the reciprocals, and zero is just fine, there's just e to the zero power, which is one. So domain is all real numbers. So figure out if there is a combination of C1 and C2 that add up to uh, zero for all inputs x, not just for one or two x values, but all x's. It can be tricky to show there's no possible C1 and C2 such that for every single infinite x, val or x value in the infinite number of choices, you'll never get zero. Or at least, yeah, show there's, for any combination of C1 and C2, there's at least one x value that won't make this zero. So if we're going to do that, we should probably try to make x appear in one place. So let's think about that. How can I make x appear in one location? How do I get this guy out of there? Divide by it, or multiply by e to the negative p. That's all we need to do to get this out. Or e to the negative px. Uh, remember, e to the negative px will never equal 0 e to some power will never actually equal zero. So I don't have to worry about divided by zero at all when I make this move. So we're down to here, e to the qx times e to the negative px is our new function x to c2. So this is q minus p times x. So it can be tricky to show that for, let's see. Let's assume C1 is 0 and show that C2 can't be 0. And then we'll assume C2 is 0 and show that C1 can't be 0. So let's suppose C1 equals 0. So C this equals 0. All right, why can I say at this point in time that C2 has to be 0 without doing any more work? Zero product property. So we got two numbers multiplied to make 0. That means 1 or both are 0. And we said e to any power, doesn't matter, never going to be 0. So zero product property, a number times something that can't be zero equals zero means the first number has to be zero. So it's never equal to zero. Thus by ZPP, zero product property, C2 has to equal zero. So if C1 is zero and this equals zero, for at, and this didn't depend on the x value. No matter what x value you're thinking of, that second factor won't equal zero. So no matter what x value you're thinking of, that second factor is never going to be zero. So this works for all x values. That second term can't be zero, which means that first C2 has to be zero. All right, so if C1 is zero, C2 has to be zero. And 
And now let's suppose, let's suppose C1 is not zero. So now you should be thinking, well, all you're doing is saying it's not zero. That doesn't really tell us any information about C1. Yeah, it has to equal negative C1, and it can't equal zero. Uh, there's one algebraic operation I can do if I know C1 is not zero. What's the one operation that I'm allowed to do that I wouldn't be allowed to do if uh, C1 was equal to zero? So I can divide by it. So if C1 is not 0, the only neat property that gives me is the ability to divide by that number. So let's go ahead and divide by C1. That's the only property that I can think of, the only algebraic operation that I can do that I couldn't do uh, without that knowledge. So we got C1 over C1. It's 1 plus. C2 over C1, and we still got 0 on the right side. I'm not sure this is necessarily a good move. So I don't think it's going to help us at all. Uh, but what I did just realize is that my first algebraic operation, multiplying by e to the px, isolated c1. How can I isolate c2 instead? Yeah, I could multiply by e to the negative qx and have it look very similar, except my e will be in the other location. I don't remember this being so difficult. Can you solve for like C1 by uh, Solve for what? I could solve for x. That seems reasonable. Will that get to where we want? Oh, let's give it a shot. Let's solve for x. So subtract C1. Equals negative C1. And divide by C2. And we're also assuming I just wrote down I have to assume C2 is not 0. Uh, what happens if C2 is 0? This whole term will be 0. And then we won't equal 0, because we'll have C1 will not be 0. So it's OK to assume C2 is not 0. It's already going to happen anyways. You could have gotten to the same step right there by continuing what you were doing with the dividing, moving the negative 1, or the 1 over to the other side with negative 1, and then dividing over C1 over C2, flipping it upside down. And Yeah, there's going to be a lot of way, a lot of ways to get here. Uh, so now we uh, ln inverse both sides. No, ln both sides. Mm -hmm. Equals.
equals just because you see a negative sign in front of that number, it doesn't mean the number is negative. It just means it's negative of whatever that value is. Uh, and then divide by p minus q. So we assume p is not equal to q, way up top, which I never said anything else about again. But that means p is not q, so p minus q is not 0. So that was an important fact. x equals. Oh, they were constant. Oh, yeah, I didn't really specify that. But yeah, any uh, x is going to be our only variable here. Okay. So everything else is going to be constants. Q minus p. So then, then we just not Well, so it wouldn't work for any x in the domain, which means it would be independent, right? Uh, so we need to, yes, this should be true for all x in the domain. Yeah. Yeah, so if we pick an x that screws this up, I think we'll be OK. Ah, right, because this is constant on the right side. Mm -hmm. So there'll be one solution. There's exactly one solution. Mm -hmm. Yes? Because C1, C2, P, and Q are all constants. So on the right side is a number, not something changing. Since the right hand side is constant. <coughs> yes, so that's a logically, or at least it felt weird to logically arrive at that contradiction. Because we did get x equals some stuff, but this is very specific one number right there, not all numbers. Yeah. So x is not always, or not all values of x make this 0. Only one value of x makes it 0, and it's this one. So all the other values won't be 0. Thus, all other x values are not solutions. Solutions to the original, and I'll just put an asterisk around it. We'll go with that as the original. So not solutions to that equation right there.